Welcome to the second of Derek Parfit's Tanner Lectures. The title of today's lecture is Kant's Formula of Universal Law. Once again, uh, there will not be a break after the lecture. We will proceed directly to comments by Professor Susan Wolf. There. The rightness of our acts, Kant claims, depends on our maxims, by which he means roughly our policies and underlying aims. Some of Kant's examples are, hasten my death to avoid suffering, let no insult pass unavenged, increase my wealth by every safe means, and the maxim of self-love or one's own happiness. Well, as those examples show, maxims can range from intentions on which we could act only once to policies on which we could act throughout our lives. Our acts are wrong, Kant claims, if our maxims could not be universal laws or we could not rationally will them to be such laws. On the first of those claims, which I can call Kant's stated criterion of strict duties, it's wrong to act on maxims that could not be universal laws. Well, that needs to be explained. In some passages, when Kant supposes that some maxim is a universal law, he's supposing that we're all permitted to act on the maxim. And that may suggest that Kant's criterion is, A, it's wrong to act on some maxim unless we could all be permitted to act on it. But Kant writes nothing that supports that reading nor would it be a helpful criterion since it assumes that we have another way of knowing whether some act is permitted. In other passages, Kant supposes that some maxim is a universal law of nature, like the laws that govern the behavior of other animals. That may suggest that Kant's criterion is B, it's wrong to act on some maxim unless we could all accept it and act upon it. But I think that can't be what Kant means. When Kant claims that certain maxims could not be universal laws, he appeals to what would happen if everyone accepted those maxims. And he never suggests that even if we all accepted these maxims, we couldn't all act on them. And besides fitting Kant's text, B would be an implausible criterion. There seems to be only one other possibility. Kant, it seems, must mean C. It's wrong to act on a maxim unless we could all successfully act on it. Now, the word everyone here refers to all the people to whom some maxim applies. Thus, the maxim give up smoking applies only to smokers. Of those who assume that Kant's criterion is C, some defend that claim. Thus, Honora O'Neill argues that by appealing to C, we can show the wrongness of coercion. We could not all successfully coerce others, O'Neill claims, because there'd be no one left to be coerced. Well, that claim overlooks mutual coercion. I might coerce you by making one credible threat, while you coerce me by making another. But O'Neill is right to claim that if we appeal to see, it is oh, it's remarkably easy to derive significant moral conclusions. Many wrong acts are condemned by C. Consider the maxim, kill other people whenever that would benefit me. Well, we couldn't all successfully act on that maxim. Some attempted murders would fail, some successful murderers would be caught and punished. So Kant's criterion condemns self-interested killing. <coughs> Such arguments, however, are too easy. C also condemns many permissible acts. Consider the maxims, give more to charity than the average person gives, become a doctor, and understand Kant's philosophy. Well, though we could all try to do these things, it's either logically or practically impossible that we could all succeed. C implies falsely that on acting on these maxims, we act wrongly. Besides condemning many innocent or good acts, C has no plausibility. Why should we think that if we couldn't all successfully act on some maxim, no one should act on it? Innocent or worthy aims can be hard to achieve, nor is it wrong to make attempts, some of which are bound to fail. Mm -hmm. 
Besides having no plausibility, C is not the criterion to which Kant himself appeals. It's what he announces, but not what he appeals to. When he condemns the maxim of making lying promises, he doesn't claim that we couldn't all succeed in acting in that way. He claims that if we all accepted the maxim or were all permitted to act on it, none of us could successfully act on it. Now, when he appeals to the effects of our being permitted to act in some way, he's really appealing to the effects of our believing that such acts are permitted. So I shall say that on Kant's actual criterion of strict duties, it's wrong to act on maxims whose being universally accepted or believed to be permissible would make it impossible for anyone successfully to act on them. Well, consider first the maxims kill, injure, and coerce others whenever that would benefit me. If we all accepted and acted on these maxims, that wouldn't make it impossible for any such act to succeed. So Kant's criterion doesn't condemn such acts. Turn next to lying. Kant's criterion, Barbara Herman writes, seems adequate for maxims of deception. Universal deception would be held by Kant to make speech and thus deception impossible. Korsgaard similarly writes, lies are usually efficacious in achieving their purposes because they deceive, but if they were universally practiced, they wouldn't deceive. On Kant's view, however, the wrongness of an act depends on the agent's maxim, and few liars act on the maxim always lie. Most act on the maxim, lie when that would benefit me. Now Kant's criterion condemns such lies only if in a world of self-interested liars, no such lies could succeed, and that would not be true. It would seldom be in our interest to deceive others, and of the small proportion of cases in which deception would benefit us, there's only a small proportion in which lying would be likely to deceive. There are, in contrast, many cases in which we benefit from speaking truly, so even if we were all self-interested liars, most of our statements would be true, and since we couldn't always tell when other people were lying, some lies would be believed and would achieve the liar's aim. To explain why theft is wrong, Kant claims, were it to be a general rule to take away his belongings from everyone, Mine and thine would be altogether at an end. For anything I might take from another, a third party would take from me. But as before, the relevant maxim isn't always steal. Most thieves act on the maxim, steal when that would benefit me. If that maxim were universally accepted, it wouldn't produce a world in which theft could never achieve its aim. There'd still be property which wouldn't always be successfully protected. So Kant's criterion, I've argued, fails to condemn most of the acts that are most clearly wrong. It doesn't condemn self-interested killing, injuring, coercing, lying, and stealing. That may suggest that Kant's criterion condemns nothing but I haven't yet considered Kant's best example. This is the maxim, make lying promises and break my promises whenever that would benefit me. Kant claims that if such lying promises were universally believed to be permissible, that would make them impossible. The universality of a law that everyone could promise whatever he pleases with the intention of not keeping it would make it impossible since no one would believe what was promised him and so on. Well, many writers take that claim to be justified. Course Guard writes there'd be no such thing as a promise in the world of the universalized maxim. The practice of offering and accepting promises would have died out under the stress of too many violations. Would there be too many violations? That's not clear. Promises are efficacious, Course Guard writes, only because they're believed, and they're believed only if they're normally true. But even if everyone accepted the self-interested promises maxim, promises would normally be true. 
This person's maxim is in part, break my promises whenever that would benefit me. And even if we all accepted that maxim, it would be better for us if we kept most of our promises. We'd benefit from being known to be promise keepers since others would then admit us to mutually advantageous agreements. Well, those claims it may be objected apply only to the actual world in which there are many people who are truly trustworthy since they keep their promises even when that's worse for them. When there are many such people, there can also be parasites who keep most of their promises to preserve their appearance of trustworthiness. But if no one was truly trustworthy, since everyone's behavior with respect to promises was wholly self-interested, the practice of promising, it may be said, could not survive. Well, that objection, I think, is partly right. Let's call promises trust requiring if they would, wouldn't be believed unless the promises were assumed to be trustworthy. If we were all known to be self-interested, trust requiring promises would never be believed. Many promises, however, are not trust requiring since the promisees assume that these promises would be kept for self-interested reasons. We can call such promises non-moral. Even if we were all known to be self-interested, such promises would still be made and often believed. Well, it may be objected that if such promises were never kept for moral reasons, they wouldn't really deserve to be called promises. And that may seem to justify Kant's claim that if his lying promises maxim were universally accepted, the practice of promising wouldn't survive making it impossible for anyone to use lying promises to achieve their aims. Well, in that form, I think the objection misunderstands Kant's argument. Kant's lying promiser has this maxim, when I believe myself to be in need of money, I shall borrow money and promise to repay it, even though I know that will never happen. Suppose first that this person's promise isn't trust requiring, most moneylenders rightly assume that in most cases it's in the borrower's interest to repay. The practice of making and keeping such promises would succeed, and it's irrelevant whether those acts would be deserved to call promises, because whatever these acts should be called, they'd sometimes achieve their aims. Well, suppose next that Kant's imagined person makes a trust requiring promise. Well, Kant could claim that if we were all known to be self-interested, no such promises would be believed. That doesn't yet show that on Kant's criterion, his lying promiser acts wrongly. Most lying promises act on a maxim that covers all promises, including those that are not trust requiring. However, Kant's imagined person might be an exception. If that person's maxim covered only trust requiring promises, Perhaps because he especially enjoyed exploiting other people's trust, Kant's criterion would condemn his acts. Well, now that we've found one kind of act that Kant's criterion condemns, we can ask whether the criterion is plausible. This criterion is in part, D, it's wrong to act on maxims whose being universally believed to be permissible would make it impossible for anyone successfully to act on them. Now, D condemns those acts whose success depends on other people's refraining from such acts because they believe them to be wrong. And D may seem to condemn these acts for the right reason. These acts are wrong, we may think, because they exploit the conscientious self-restraint of others in ways that, if universal, would undermine the existence of valuable practices such as that of trust requiring promises. Kant's criterion, however, seems more plausible than it really is. D applies to acts that many people believe to be wrong, and of the acts that are widely believed to be wrong, many are wrong. But Kant's criterion isn't intended just to appeal to our moral beliefs. To judge this criterion, we should turn to actual or imagined cases in which people's moral beliefs are mistaken. Suppose that because my nation's tyrannical ruler is waging an unjust war, I adopt the maxim, kill this tyrant to end this war. 
Most of my fellow citizens, we can suppose, would be appalled by such an act, since they accept Kant's view that we should never try to overthrow any established government. Because this tyrant's bodyguards know that nearly everyone accepts this view, they don't expect any attempt on the tyrant's life. That makes them inattentive, which allows me to kill this tyrant, thereby ending this war. Now, if everyone believed that my maxim was permissible, the bodyguards would be more alert, making it impossible for any such attempt to succeed. On these assumptions, D condemns my act. Well, I think this example counts against this criterion. First, though Kant believed that killing our nation's ruler is always wrong, that belief is false. It would have been right for a German to kill Hitler during the Second World War. Second, more important, even if tyrannicide were always wrong, D couldn't provide the reason why. The objection to tyrannicide couldn't be that if we all believed that tyrannicide could be justified, that would make it impossible for any such act to succeed. Suppose next, and this is the more important case, that during this war, some German civilian knows that Jews are being rounded up and killed. This person acts on the maxim, tell lies to the police, when I could thereby help any Jews to escape. We can plausibly suppose that if all Germans had believed that such lies were permissible, that would have made it impossible for anyone to help Jews in this way. German policemen would not have believed what civilians told them about the whereabouts of Jews. On these assumptions, D condemns this life-saving act. Well, Kant might have accepted that conclusion since he condemned lying to a would-be murderer about where his intended victim is. That's very similar. But such lies are clearly justified. And in this example, D has no plausibility. It's no objection to this way of saving people's lives that if we all believed such acts to be permissible, that would make them impossible. Now, that example is intentionally similar to that of the lying trust requiring promise, Kant's best example. The lying promises act succeeds because there are many people who can be trusted to keep their promises since they believe that breaking promises is wrong. If everyone was known to believe that lying promises are not wrong, that would make it impossible, Kant claims, for anyone to act successfully on this lying promises maxim. In the same way, when this German civilian lies to help some Jews to escape, this act succeeds because there are many people who can be trusted not to lie to the police since they believe that such lies are wrong. If everyone was known to believe that such lies are not wrong, that would make it impossible for anyone successfully to act on this life-saving maxim. Well, the difference between these maxims is only in what these lies are intended to achieve and that difference is ignored by D. Suppose next that German soldiers of this period could be relied upon to obey orders because they believed that disobedience would be wrong. That might have allowed some soldier to act on the maxim, disobey orders when that would help any Jews to escape. It might be true that if all German soldiers had known to believe that such disobedience was permissible, their officers wouldn't have given orders whose being disobeyed would allow Jews to escape. D would then mistakenly condemn this soldier's act. Well, as these cases show, D is wholly unacceptable. It, criterion, it does condemn some acts that are wrong, but for the wrong reason, and it condemns some acts that are clearly right. Kant's criterion is also in part it's wrong to act on maxims whose being universally accepted or acted on would make it impossible for anyone successfully to act on them. Now, there are many maxims which, even if they were universally believed to be permissible, wouldn't be universally accepted. And according, acting on such maxims, though it wouldn't be condemned by the previous criterion, would be condemned by this. Now, according to some writers, Kant's criterion mistakenly condemns several good maxims, such as give to the poor and refuse to accept bribes. If those maxims were universally accepted, that would make it impossible to act on them since there'd cease to be any poor people and no one would offer bribes. <laughs> 
Well, that couldn't show, these objectors claim, that acting on these maxims is wrong. Course Guard, however, answers that objection well. If we accepted the maxim, give to the poor, our aim would be to abolish poverty. If our maxim's universal acceptance made it impossible to act on it because poverty would be abolished, that wouldn't defeat but achieve our aim. There are other cases, though, in which this reply would fail. Suppose we're living at a time when many people accept some code of honor, like the one that led Pushkin to his death. Consider the maxim, fight duels to preserve my honor, but always shoot to miss. Now, if everyone accepted that maxim, the practice of dueling would become farcical and would not survive. That would defeat this maxim's purpose. Well, it may seem that E is right to condemn this maxim, since dueling is wrong. But E doesn't condemn the maxim, fight duels to preserve my honor and always shoot to kill. And of these maxims, the second is clearly worse. Well, as that shows, E condemns the first maxim for the wrong reason. It's no objection to this maxim that if it were universally accepted, the practice of dueling wouldn't survive. Turn next to the maxims, never take the first slice, don't speak until others have spoken, and when you meet another car on a narrow road, stop and wait until the other car has passed. <laughs> if we all acted on these maxims, none of us would achieve our aims. Cakes would never get eaten, conversations never get started, and journeys on narrow roads would never end. That doesn't show that acting on these maxims is wrong. For a more serious example, consider the maxim, have no children so as to have more time and energy to work for the future of humanity. <laughs> if we all acted on that maxim, that would make it impossible for anyone su successfully to act on it since humanity would have no future. So E condemns that maxim in a way that's clearly mistaken. Well, it may next be said that in some of the claims that I've quoted, Kant's fault is only to exaggerate, since it goes too far to say that if we were all self-interested, no promises would ever be believed, speech would be impossible, and there'd be no property. Kantians might say that these claims, even if overstated, remind us that some valuable practices and institutions depend in part for their full effectiveness on moral motivation. This reply, however, cannot defend Kant's criterion. Since Kant condemns maxims that couldn't be universal laws, his criterion can't be given a more moderate reading. Now that may be why Kant moves between claims at opposite extremes. Herman writes that Kant's criterion seems adequate for maxims of deception and coercion, but while she condemns maxims of deception, with the claim that if they were universally accepted, no one could successfully act on them, she condemns maxims of coercion with the claim that we could not all successfully act on them. Now, since the word universal can cover both all and none, those claims may seem to appeal to the same criterion. But the first appeals to his stated criterion, the second to his actual criterion, and as I've said, those are very different. Most important maxims, whether good or bad, come in between those two extremes. These are maxims on which, even in the most favorable circumstances, we couldn't all successfully act. But there are also maxims on which, even in the least favorable circumstances, some of us could successfully act. So almost all important maxims are condemned by the version of Kant's criterion which requires universal success <clears throat> hardly any important maxims are condemned by the version which appeals to universal failure. So Kant's criterion is either much too weak or much too strong. <clears throat> In neither version, moreover, does Kant's criterion appeal to a morally relevant idea. For another illustration of this point, we can imagine a version of Kant's criterion that tries to occupy the middle ground. This can be F, it's wrong to act on maxims whose being universally accepted or acted on would greatly reduce the number of people who could successfully act on them. 
Well, by appealing to F rather than D or E, we would be able to condemn a larger number of wrong acts. Thus, if everyone accepted the maxim of a self-interested liar, that might reduce the number of people who could lie successfully if they tried. But F couldn't explain why lying is wrong. There are many innocent maxims that F mistakenly condemns. It wasn't wrong for romantic poets to try to have the experience of being the only human being in some natural wilderness, nor is it wrong to buy only second-hand books or give surprise parties. Well, we can now turn different subject. Kant's famous formula of universal law. It's wrong to act on some maxim unless we could also rationally will it to be true that this maxim is a universal law. Kant sometimes suggests that if some maxim fails this test, that gives us only an unstrict or imperfect duty not to act on it. We are sometimes permitted not to. On this reading of Kant's formula, we'd be permitted, I say, to sometimes to act on these maxims, but we should ignore that reading, as Kant himself often does. As we've seen, Kant's criterion of strict duties fails to condemn nearly all of the acts that any adequate criterion must condemn, so we should ask whether Kant's formula can fill this gap by implying that some kinds of act are always wrong, or at least always prima facie wrong, even if that might be overridden. Well, Kant often claims that in applying his formula, we should imagine that our maxim would become a universal law of nature. On this version of Kant's formula, which I should call the law of nature formula, it's wrong to act on some maxim unless we could also rationally will it to be true that everyone accepts this maxim and acts on it. As before, everyone applies to all those people to whom the maxim applies. In other passages, Kant appeals to what we can call the permissibility formula. It's wrong to act on some maxim unless we could also rationally will it to be true that everyone is morally permitted to act in that way. Well, Kant assumes that if it were permissible to act on the maxims he discusses, people would be more likely to act in these ways, and these effects would be produced not by its being permissible to act in these ways, but by people's believing that. So Kant is really appealing here to what I call the moral belief formula. It's wrong to act on a maxim unless we could also rationally will it to be true that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. Now, Kant remarks that he's not proposing a new principle, but only a more precise statement of the principle which common human reason has always before its eyes. That remark understates Kant's originality, but these two versions of Kant's formula can be claimed to develop the ideas that are implied by two familiar questions. What if everyone did that? And what if everyone thought like you? The wrongness of an act, Kant claims, depends on the agent's maxim. Now, as I say, Kant sometimes uses maxim to refer to the policy on which someone acts. On a second use, a maxim consists both of the policy and of the person's underlying aim. Suppose two merchants both act on the policy, never cheat my customers. One merchant acts in this way because he believes it to be his duty, while the other's motive is to preserve his reputation and profits. These merchants, we can say, both have the same policy maxim, but have different deep maxims. Kant's formula shouldn't, I believe, appeal to either kind of maxim. Consider some egoist who has only one policy and one underlying aim. Do whatever would be best for me. Now, this man couldn't rationally will 
that his maxim be universal. Egoists have strong reasons to want other people to accept and follow not their egoistic maxim, but various moral principles. Egoists suffer from the egoism of others. Since this egoist maxim cannot be rationally willed to be universal, Kant's formula implies that whatever this man does, he acts wrongly. He acts wrongly not only when he steals, breaks promises, and harms other people, but also when, for self-interested reasons, he acts honestly, keeps his promises, and helps other people. Well, those are unacceptable conclusions. When this egoist saves a drowning child because he hopes to get some reward, he isn't acting wrongly. Turn now to someone who has mistaken moral beliefs. Our example can be Kant himself during the period when he accepted the maxim, never lie. Well, that maxim is condemned by Kant's formula since Kant could not rationally will that no one ever tells lies, not even to prevent the would-be murderers from finding their victims. So Kant's formula implies not only that Kant would have acted wrongly if he told such a murderer the truth, but also that he did act wrongly whenever he acted on his maxim, never lie. Since this maxim can't be universalized, Kant acted wrongly whenever he told anyone the truth. That's another unacceptable conclusion. According to some writers, Kant distinguishes between some acts being wrong and its being contrary to duty. On this account, when my egoist keeps his promises and saves people's lives, Kant's formula implies that these acts are wrong without implying that they're contrary to duty. Now, Kant, I believe, doesn't draw that distinction. He often claims that by applying his formula, we can answer the question whether some act would be contrary to duty or whether it's in conformity with duty, which is what we would mean by wrong, contrary to duty. For Kant's formula to answer such questions, it must be revised. An act's wrongness depends not on the agent's policy or underlying aim, but on what this person is intentionally doing. In the morally relevant description of someone's act, we should include what this person intends her act to achieve and the other morally relevant effects that she foresees. It's often irrelevant, however, on what policy this person acts. When Kant told someone the truth, it's irrelevant that he was acting on the policy never lie, so that he would have told the truth even to the would-be murderer. And when my egoist saves someone's life, it's irrelevant that his underlying aim is only to get some reward. As Kant would claim, this man's act is not wrong, though it has no moral worth. To meet these objections, Kant's formula could become, it's wrong to act in some way unless we could also rationally will it to be true that everyone does whatever in acting in this way we would be intentionally doing, or that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. Those revise the law of nature and moral belief versions. Well, to say words, I shall continue to discuss the unrevised version. And Kant sometimes uses maxims in a thinner sense, as when he discusses the maxim, hasten my death to avoid suffering. That maxim isn't a policy or a principle. And when someone acts on this maxim, what he's intentionally doing is hastening his death to avoid suffering. So in most of what follows, when it makes a difference, we could understand maxim in that thin sense. To apply Kant's formula, we must make assumptions about what we could rationally will. Now, on one view, it's always irrational to act wrongly. But that view, even if true, is irrelevant here. For Kant's formula to succeed, it must provide a criterion for the wrongness of acts which doesn't itself assume that the acts are wrong. It would be pointless to claim both that our act is wrong unless we could rationally will that everyone acts in this way, 
and that we couldn't rationally will that everyone acts in this way because such acts are wrong. And Kant doesn't do that when he appeals to his examples. According to another view, we're rationally required to give significant weight to other people's well-being. It's irrational to act wrongly when our acts, though benefiting ourselves, impose certain great burdens on others. While that view, even if true, is also irrelevant here, Kant's formula doesn't assume that such acts are irrational. The main idea behind his formula is that though it may be rational for us to act in ways that are wrong, we couldn't rationally will either that everyone acts in these ways or that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. So when we apply Kant's formula, we shouldn't appeal either to the irrationality of acting wrongly or to the view that it would be irrational to give little or no weight to other people's well-being. We should appeal to claims about non-moral and non-altruistic rationality. On one such view, we couldn't rationally will that everyone acts in some way if such a world would be bad for us. Now that may seem not to be Kant's view since he calls the principle of prudence or self-love a merely hypothetical imperative which applies to us only insofar as we care about our future well-being. But if we care about our future, as Kant assumes we all do, it would be instrumentally irrational for us to will that other people act in ways that would be bad for us. Some Kantians prefer to claim that we couldn't rationally will a world in which our true needs would be worse met or our rational agency would be frustrated or our aims and purposes would be harder to fulfill. Well, I shall appeal to the claim that we couldn't rationally will what would be worse for ourselves, but most of my arguments could be restated in those other ways. I shall also appeal to claims about what would be likely to be good or bad for us. That just helps the formula. Kant's formula works best when it's applied to maxims or acts of which three things are true. It would be possible for many people to act on this maxim or in this way. Whatever the number who act in this way, the effects of each act would be the same or roughly similar. And these acts would be randomly or roughly equally distributed between different people. These claims apply to many of the acts that are most clearly wrong, such as acts of self-interested injuring, coercing, or deceiving. Most people could often act in these ways. Whatever the number who act in these ways, most of these acts would have similar effects since they benefit their agents but impose greater burdens on others. And in many cases, these burdens would be likely to be randomly or roughly equally distributed. In such cases, it would be likely to be worse for most of us if everyone, rather than no one, acted in these ways. Even if each of us would gain from acting in these ways, each would be likely to lose more from the similar acts of others. Kant's formula condemns these acts since we couldn't rationally will that such acts be universal. Well, in some of these cases, though any such act would impose burdens on others, it's also true that since these burdens would be spread over many people, each act's effects on each other person would be either trivial or imperceptible. Some examples could involve pollution, soil erosion, overfishing, overgrazing, overpopulation. In such cases, if each of us considers only the effects of our own acts, we may believe that we're not acting wrongly. Effects on everyone else, is each person, is very trivial. When applied to such cases, Kant's formula is much more successful than most other relevant principles, such as the act utilitarian principle and ordinary principles about harming others or the golden rule. Though each of these acts would impose only trivial burdens on others, we couldn't rationally will that everyone acts in these ways, since these acts would together impose on everyone, including us, great burdens. So these aren't the cases that Kant had in mind, 
but they count strongly in favor of his formula. I think these are the cases where the formula really works best. When the first three conditions, though, are not all met, the formula works less well. It here faces several objections, of which I have time to discuss only one. There are some wrong acts whose bad effects are not randomly or equally distributed between different people. These acts impose burdens only on the people who are in certain groups. The golden rule requires impartiality by telling us to treat others as we would want or will that others treat us. Kant's formula makes us impartial in a less direct way. When we apply this formula, rather than asking, what if they did that to me, we ask, what if everyone did that? Now, this kind of impartiality has great importance. And if it's permissible for us to act in some way, it must be permissible for everyone else to act in the same way as us in the same circumstances. When we act wrongly, as Kant points out, we often make unfair exceptions for ourselves, allowing ourselves to do things that we wouldn't want or will other people to do. In Kant's formula, it's wrong to do what we could not rationally will everyone to do. But this kind of impartiality is not, however, enough. Like the golden rule, Kant's formula applies best to those wrong acts with which we benefit ourselves in ways that impose greater burdens on others. We couldn't rationally will that other people do these things to us since we would then have to bear these greater burdens. But on Kant's formula, we don't ask whether we could will that other people do these things to us. We ask whether we could will that everyone does these things to others. And we may know that even if everyone did these things to others, no one would do these things to us. Kant's formula may then fail to condemn these wrong acts. I call this the impartiality objection. If Kant's formula can't condemn those acts, it doesn't ensure the kind of impartiality that, as Kant assumed, moral reasoning requires. <clears throat> Consider first some white racist in the age of segregation. This man might have claimed to be following the two versions of Kant's formula of universal law. He might have said, when I exclude blacks from my hotel, I could rationally will that everyone acts in this way. Around here, everyone does act in this way. Every hotel owner excludes blacks. And I could rationally will that everyone believes such acts to be right. That's what most of us do believe, and if the blacks and commies change their mind, that would be fine with me. Well, in making these claims, would this man have misunderstood Kant's formula? I'm not asking whether he would have misunderstood Kant's moral theory. Kant was in some ways remarkably egalitarian, and there's much in Kant's views that would condemn such racist attitudes and acts. My question is only what's implied by Kant's formula. Well, Kant didn't consider cases of this kind. When he imagined some wrongdoer asking, could I will that my maxim be a universal law, Kant assumes that this person's maxim isn't such a law. But in some cases, like that of this racist, a wrongdoer's maxim may already be universal since it may already be acted on by all those people to whom it applies. Now, Kant's formula permits these people's acts if they could rationally will that they and others continue to act as they are now doing. Now, if it's bad for these people that others are acting in the same way as them, as would be true, for example, in some anarchic war of all against all, these people couldn't rationally will the continuation of the status quo. But if the status quo is good for these people, we may face the following problem. The status quo may be good for these people precisely because their bad maxim is universal. Those to whom some maxim applies 
may be some powerful and privileged group who are oppressing other people. Well, Kant's formula condemns these people's acts only if they couldn't rationally will that they keep their privileged position. And for the reasons given above, we can't defend such claims in ways that assume that these people's acts are wrong, nor can we appeal to the claim that they are rationally required to give significant weight to other people's well-being. When we apply Kant's formula, we must claim that it would be non-morally irrational for such people to will that they keep their privileged position. And such claims may be hard to defend. Nor would it help to turn to the moral belief version of Kant's formula. If these people could rationally will that everyone acts in the same way as them, they could rationally will that everyone believes such acts to be permissible they'd have no relevant reason to prefer that everyone believes their acts to be wrong. Consider, for example, those men who treat women as inferior, denying them various rights and privileges and giving less weight to their well-being. On Kant's formula, such a man acts wrongly if he couldn't rationally will it to be true that everyone treats women as inferior to men. Now, that's not a useful claim. If such a man could rationally will that he treats women as inferior, it doesn't help to ask whether he could rationally will that everyone acts in this way and that everyone believes such acts to be justified. For most of history, most people, including most women, have treated women as inferior to men. And most people, including most women, have believed such treatment to be justified. On Kant's formula, it's not wrong for men to treat women as inferior if these men could rationally will that they regain their old supremacy and they could also rationally will that feminists who now object to male supremacy come to believe their objections are mistaken. And slave owners did not act wrongly if they could have rationally willed that they keep their slaves and willed that everyone, including all the slaves, believe slavery to be justified. We would do better here to appeal to the golden rule, which Kant contemptuously dismissed. Men and slave owners would not will that they be treated as inferior or as mere property if they supposed that they themselves were going to be women or slaves. For another example, consider global inequality. On any plausible moral view, those who control most of the world's resources ought to transfer some of their wealth to the billion poorest people in the world, those whose daily income is less than $2. Many rich people now transfer nothing to these poor people. Kant's formula doesn't condemn these people's acts if they could rationally will it to be true that all rich people act like M and that everyone, including the poor, believes such acts to be justified. Well, as before, Kant's formula here achieves nothing. When Korsgaard discusses Kant's formula of universal law, she writes, the kind of case around which the view is framed and which it handles best is the temptation to make oneself an exception, selfishness, meanness, advantage taking, and disregard for the rights of others. It's this sort of thing, not violent crimes born of despair or illness, that serves as Kant's model of immoral conduct. I do not think we can fault him on this, for this and not the other is the sort of evil that most people are tempted by in their ordinary lives. Well, what Kant's view handles best is not, I have argued, all kinds of selfishness or advantage taking. Kant's formula fails to condemn many of the acts with which some people take advantage of others, as when men, the rich and powerful, take advantage of women, the poor and the weak. And since Kant presents his formula as the supreme principle of morality, we can fault his formula for its failure to condemn such acts. These kinds of selfishness and advantage taking are precisely the sorts of evil that the rich and powerful are tempted by and often commit in their ordinary lives. Some may think that in presenting this objection, I have misinterpreted Kant's formula. 
Thomas Nagel suggests that when we ask whether we could rationally will that everyone acts in the same way as us, Kant intends us to imagine that we ourselves are going to be in everyone else's position. That suggestion makes Kant's formula more like the golden rule. <clears throat> but none of Kant's claims about his formula support Nagel's reading, and there are contrary passages, such as Kant's discussion of the self-reliant man, who has the maxim of not helping others who are in need. When he explains why this man could not rationally will that his maxim be a universal law, Kant writes, many cases could occur in which, by such a law of nature arisen from his own will, he would rob himself of all the assistance he wishes for himself. Well, if he intended this man to imagine that he would be in the positions of all the people who would need help, it would be baffling why he doesn't say that here. Nagel defends his reading with the claim that if Kant didn't intend us to imagine being in everyone else's position, Kant's formula would be open to serious objections. But even the greatest philosophers can overlook possible objections. We shouldn't assume that when great philosophers seem to make some mistake, they cannot have meant what they wrote. Rawls proposes another reading of Kant's formula, when we apply this formula, Rawls suggests, Kant intends us to imagine that we don't know anything about ourselves or our circumstances. We should ask what we could rationally will if we were behind a veil of ignorance, not knowing whether we are men or women, rich or poor, fortunate or in need of help. Like Nagel, Rawls supports his reading with the claim that it seems needed to defend Kant's formula from objections. Rawls writes, <clears throat> I believe that Kant may have assumed that our decision is subject to at least two kinds of limit on information. That some limits are necessary seems evident. But as before, even if Kant ought to have made such an assumption, that doesn't show that he did. In his discussions of his formula, Kant never suggests that we should imagine being behind a veil of ignorance. Scanlon proposes a third reading. Kant writes, I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my maxim be a universal law. Scanlon suggests that when we apply this test, Kant intends us to ask whether everyone could rationally will that our maxim be a universal law. And to defend this reading, Scanlon writes that if Kant were merely telling us to ask ourselves what we ourselves could rationally will, he would be wrong to claim that his different formulas would have the same implications. Well, like the other two proposals, Scanner's proposal cannot, I believe, be what Kant meant. Kant gives nearly 20 different statements of the formula of universal law, none of which refer to what everyone could will. These proposals are best regarded not as interpretations, but of ways of revising Kant's formula so that it avoids the impartiality objection. Now, these and other such proposals are as shown on the diagram, which is unreadable in the handout, and I shan't take you down these swerving tracks here. Um, According to one, to decide whether some act is wrong, well, I'll let you look at it briefly, you get the idea. It's just meant to cover all of the main possibilities for this kind of view. According to one, to decide whether some act is wrong, it's enough to ask whether we could rationally will it to be true that we act in this way. Now, as I've said, even Kant doesn't make that assumption. And he thinks that it is always irrational to act wrongly, but you don't argue for the wrongness of the act by claiming that it's irrational. According to four, the law of nature version of Kant's formula of universal law, we should ask whether we could rationally will that everyone acts in this way. And according to seven, the moral belief version, we should ask whether we could will that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. Now, 
these formulas I've argued fail, many wrongdoers could rationally will both that everyone acts like them and that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. These people may know that even if everyone did to others what they are doing, no one would do these things to them. Many men, for example, could will that everyone treats women as inferior. Two, the golden rule avoids this objection. These men couldn't rationally will such treatment if they were going to be women. According to five, Nagel's proposal, Kant's law of nature formula becomes like the golden rule. We ask what we could rationally will everyone to do if we suppose that we ourselves were going to be in everyone's position. Eight is a similar revision of Kant's moral belief formula. Uh, the numbers don't matter. When revised in this way, these formulas avoid the impartiality objection. It's hard, however, to imagine ourselves in the position of every other person, all 10 billion of them. And when Rawls discusses Hare's version of this view, he suggests another objection. In imagining ourselves in all these people's positions, we shall think of ourselves as living all of these lives. That's what Hare tells us to do. And that may lead us to ignore the separateness of these lives and the fact that one person's burdens can't be compensated by benefits to other people. So we may thus be led to ignore the grounds for accepting principles of distributive justice. Rawls suggests that to avoid this objection, we should imagine that we're behind a veil of ignorance. We should suppose that rather, being in, rather than being in everyone's position, we shall be in one person's position, but we don't know whose. When revised in this way, Kant's law of nature and moral belief formulas become six and nine on the chart. I should drop those sentences. Scanlon suggests that rather than asking what we ourselves could rationally will, we should ask what everyone could rationally will. Now, according to Kant's law of nature formula, our act is wrong unless we ourselves could rationally will it to be true that everyone acts in this way. On Scanlon's proposal, that would become an act is wrong unless everyone could rationally will that everyone acts in this way. Well, it's worth making a further revision. If we appeal to what everyone could will, that's enough to achieve impartiality. We needn't ask whether everyone could will that everyone acts in some way, and there are some acts that are right, though we couldn't rationally will that everyone acts in these ways. Kant did not act wrongly, for example, in having no children. So we do better to turn to what I call the formula of universally willed acts. An act is wrong unless it could be rationally willed by everyone. Well, that's a wider version of Kant's consent principle. On that principle, we ought to treat everyone only in ways to which they could rationally consent. On this wider formula, an act is wrong unless everyone, if they had the choice, could rationally choose that this act be done. According to Kant's moral belief formula, our act is wrong unless we ourselves could rationally will it to be true that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. On Scanlon's proposal, this becomes an act is wrong unless everyone could rationally will it to be true that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. In Scanlon's words, to answer the question of right and wrong, what we must ask is what general principles of action could we all will? Now, that formula is strongly suggested by several of Kant's claims about his other two main principles, the formulas of autonomy and of the realm of ends. For example, Kant refers to the concept of every rational being as one who must regard himself as giving universal law. Kant never explicitly appeals to what everyone could rationally will. The phrase just quoted, for example, ends who must regard himself as giving universal law through all the maxims of his will. Well, if each person regards himself as willing universal laws, he's not asking which are the laws that everyone could will. 
At several other points, when Kant seems about to appeal to what everyone could will, he returns to his formula of universal law, telling us to appeal to the laws that we ourselves could will. Now, I think he doesn't make that further step because he thinks it's not necessary. They have all the same implications. But as I've argued, the form of universal law needs to be revised, and this is the revision that seems closest to Kant's own view. Now, we might call it the formula of universally willed moral beliefs, but I restate it and give it a shorter name as Kant's contractualist formula. We ought to act on the principles whose universal acceptance everyone could rationally will. Finally, on my chart, there's one other view that differs from Kant's formula by including a veil of ignorance. On the best-known version of such a view, or Rawls's formula, we ought to act on the principles that it would be rational for everyone to choose as the principles that we'd all accept if no one knew anything about themselves or their circumstances. Now, of these formulas, the best, I believe, are the formula of universally willed acts and Kant's contractualist formula. Uh, if they're the best, it's also pleasing that they're the simplest. These formulas both appeal to what everyone could rationally will. The first formula applies this test directly to particular acts. The second applies it to the principles on which we act. In tomorrow's lecture, my main subject will be Kant's contractualist formula. If we combine this formula with the right view about reasons, we shall reach what may be the best version of contractualism. And we shall also be led, I think, to some surprising conclusions. Today's commentator is Professor Susan Wolf. Professor Wolf has just taken up uh, this year a new position as the Edna J. Curie Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, after having taught for many years at Johns Hopkins University, where she was chair of the philosophy department, as well as Dwayne Peterson Professor of Ethics. Prior to that, she taught at the University of Maryland and at Harvard. She has written extensively on topics in ethics, metaphysics, and the philosophy of mind. Her book, Freedom Within Reason, is one of the most influential works about the freedom of the will to have been written in recent decades. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Wolf to Berkeley. Thank you. I didn't realize until it, can you hear me? Is this I didn't realize until it was too late to revise my comments um, that the lecture on the universal, on the formula of universal law uh, was to be given on election day. That's especially fitting since the ethics of voting or not voting um, is a perfect example by which to consider the formula of universal law. Uh, but except for a reference to an elected official at the end, of, an imaginary elected official at the end of my comments, I'm not working that in. Uh, nonetheless, if there's anyone here who hasn't voted and for whom uh, leaving this lecture early or, uh, would enable them to vote, uh, I do believe it passes the formula of universal law, and I could give my rational consent to it. Yesterday, Derek Parfit's lecture focused on Kant's formula of ends in themselves, or as Alan Wood referred to it as Kant's formula of humanity. He rightly called this Kant's best love statement of the moral law, especially if by best loved he meant best loved by scholars and especially by friendly scholars of Kant. The formula that is the topic of today's lecture, the formula of universal law, has some claim to being best loved by Kant himself. At least Kant wrote of it that of all the formulations of the moral law, one does better if in moral judgment he follows the rigorous method and takes as his basis the universal formula. Parfit's lecture today shows us many reasons why we should not take Kant's advice on this score. 
I share many of Parfit's reasons for being dissatisfied with this formula, as I hope my remarks will make clear. Still, Kant also thought that each formulation had something distinctive in it to offer, that each brought out some aspect of the moral law that was not highlighted by the others. If Kant is right, then there may be something important and distinctive about the universalization formula that Parfit's discussion fails to bring out. In seeing what this might be, it will be helpful to distinguish, as Parfit does, between two ways in which, according to Kant, a maxim can fail to be universalizable. A maxim may fail first because a world in which everyone acts on the maxim is impossible to conceive. The idea of people acting on the maxim in question self-destructs when we try to imagine a world in which everyone so acts. When we ask whether the universalization of a maxim can so much as be conceived, we put our maxim through what John Rawls refers to as the contradiction in conception test. Kant believed that if a maxim failed this test, then acting on it would be wrong. The formula of universal law, however, requires that it meet more than this contradiction in conception test. Of those maxims on which we can imagine everyone acting, we must ask whether we can will a world in which they do so. Could we, consistently with everything else that we will, will that everyone act on the maxim on which we are considering acting? If not, the maxim fails what Rawls calls the contradiction in the will test. In that case, too, according to Kant, acting on that maxim would be wrong. Now, the contradiction in conception test has been much talked about by students of Kant, not just in scholarly treatises and conferences, but in introductory ethics classrooms as well. Partly, I think, this is because if it were true that one could separate right actions from wrong on the basis of whether one could so much as conceive of their maxims being universally adopted, that would be a really neat result. And because it is sort of fun to think about whether and why various types of action would self-destruct upon being universally performed. If one can find anything really neat or fun when studying or when teaching Kant, one should make the most of it. Partly, also, I think the test has been taken seriously because it seems to yield some interesting and plausible results. Parfit admits that the test succeeds in ruling out the abuse of what he calls trust-requiring promises. And though he speaks of these as being just one rather specialized species of promise, I think they rather constitute the core of promising. When one says, I promise to meet you for lunch, to return the book tomorrow, to keep your secret, one commits oneself to following through regardless of whether it is or continues to be in one's interest to do so. The usefulness of promising depends on our being able to rely, that is, to trust people to live up to such commitments. Without trust requiring promises, we would still be able to make contracts and other less formal sorts of agreements. These would give us some of the benefits we get from promising, but probably not all of them. Moreover, it seems to me that the quality of human interaction in the one case is different from what it is in the other. A world in which agreements were all made by contract and none made by promises would be a colder and more desolate world. A similar line of thought might be applied to the practice of truth-telling. That is, it seems plausible to say that at the core of ordinary human communication is the understanding that people will tell you the truth whether it is in their interest to do so or not. That, in other words, you can trust them to be honest. It is against the background of this assumption that I believe what you tell me simply because you tell me, and not, for example, because you tell me and I have reason to believe that it would not be in your interest on this occasion for you to tell me something that is false. Ordinarily, when I believe what you say, it is not because you're saying it gives me evidence that it is true. Rather, I believe you, and in so doing, I trust you to be honest. Though the possibility of taking people's statements as evidence of those statements' truth would give us some of the benefits we get from simply being able to believe people, it would not, I think, give us all of them. <laughs> 
Moreover, the quality of human interaction in the one case is different from what it is in the other. A world in which whether to believe what people said depended on calculations of what it would be in their interest to say would be a colder and more desolate world. If I'm right, then trust requiring promises and trust requiring communication play a much bigger role in our lives than Parfit's remarks suggest. And so if, as I think, the contradiction in conception test rules out the abuse of these practices, that is a fairly significant result. Nonetheless, I think Parfit is right to reject the contradiction in conception test. And he is right because, as he says, it fails to capture a morally relevant idea. As Parfit points out, the fact that a policy is such that if everyone followed it, it would become impossible for anyone to follow it, does not in itself give us a moral reason not to do it. If it did, as Parfit notes, it would be immoral to throw surprise parties or to adopt the policy of never taking the first slice. I love that example because it seemed as if it gave me some moral credit when I did take the first slice. But uh, if you think that through, that doesn't actually work. <laughs> also, though I believe that part of what is objectionable about making a false promise or lying is connected to the failure of these acts to meet the condition of universalizability, it is not, I think, specifically related to their failing to meet the contradiction in conception test. The second test, to which Perf Parfit turns in the second half of his lecture, seems to have more going for it. According to this test, an act is wrong if one not, cannot will its maxim to be universally obeyed. Unlike the first test, this one does seem to capture something morally significant. Specifically, the idea that if I would not be willing to have everyone act a certain way, it would be wrong for me to act that way, expresses the idea that, in Parfit's words, it is wrong to make special exceptions of ourselves. This thought, Parfit notes, captures a kind of impartiality which it is plausible to think is fundamentally connected to a moral point of view. Parfit, however, believes that this kind of impartiality is not enough. For, he argues, the contradiction in the will test, or more generally, the formula of the universal law, could be passed or satisfied by a white racist hotel owner who wants to exclude blacks from staying at his hotel, or by men who want to treat women as inferior beings, or by a rich man who wants to keep his money rather than transfer any to the poor. According to Parfit, were a rich white racist male to ask himself whether he would be willing to have everyone act as he wishes to act, he might well answer yes. If everyone were to act in ways that favor rich, white, racist men, that would be perfectly all right with him. Since, according to Parfit, these acts would not be excluded by the condition of, universal, uh, the condition of universalizability or the formula of universal law, he concludes that what is wrong with these acts must be located elsewhere. To see what is wrong with these acts, Parfit argues, we should not focus on what the agent would be willing to have everyone do. Rather, we should focus on what everyone, including the poor, the blacks, and the women, would be willing to have the agent do. To make this shift is, in effect, to revert to a consideration of the formula of ends in themselves, or at least to Parfit's interpretation of it, as the principle of rational consent or the principle of universally willed acts. Does the formula of universal law really allow the kinds of racism, sexism, and what, for lack of a better word, I will call classism that Parfit envisions? Could a racist, sexist, classist sincerely affirm a world in which everyone acted as he is contemplating acting? As Parfit notes, the answer may depend on which description of the contemplated action or policy we choose as the relevant characterization of the agent's maxim. The maxim of the racist, for example, might be formulated as, out of personal preference, I shall refuse to do business with blacks, or alternatively as, out of personal preference, I shall refuse to do business with members of a race other than my own. More abstractly still, he may be described as wishing to refuse to do business with other rational beings on the basis of properties that are morally arbitrary. 
Depending on how the agent formulates his maxim, his answer to the question of whether he would be willing to have everyone act on that maxim may vary. Even if we accept the rather thick characterizations Parfit initially uses to describe the objectionable actions, we might questioning the reason, question the reasoning Parfit attributes to his rich man in the following way. You think that you can will a world in which the rich don't help the poor, but wealth is not an essential property of yours. You could lose your money, like Job, and become one of the world's poor. And in that case, you wouldn't want to have willed a world in which the rich treat you as you now want to treat the poor. Thus, one might argue that the rich man cannot rationally will that the rich don't help the poor. Unfortunately, analogous lines of reasoning in the case of the racist and the sexist are implausible. Still, the spirit of the formula of universal law seems contrary to racism and sexism, too. For if the core idea behind universalizability is that it is wrong to make an exception of oneself, a natural extension of that idea would recognize that it is wrong to make an exception of one's race or one's gender as well. By appealing to the spirit of universalizability and to Kant's views about which features of persons are morally significant, we may be able to supplement the formula of universal law with some rules for choosing the appropriate level of description for the maxims to be tested by it. And in that way, we may be able to yield prohibitions against the sorts of racist and sexist behavior Parfit imagines. If we could do that, then the formula of universal law might turn out to yield the same conclusions as the formula of ends in themselves, at least with respect to racism, sexism, and other forms of discrimination. What I would be willing to have everyone to do would, in that case, when it came to treating one category of rational beings differently from another, would, in that case, arguably be the same as what everyone would be willing to have me do. In that case, Parfit might think the two formulas were equivalent, or at least equivalent enough for the purposes of moral evaluation. Both, Parfit might think, would capture a single kind of impartiality, the kind that morality should embody. I'm not certain, however, that the formulas are equivalent or that they would capture the same kind of impartiality. Nor am I sure that there is only one kind of impartiality that is morally significant. To give a sense of my doubts, I shall offer two examples. First, let us reconsider the case of the German who wants to assassinate Hitler. Parfit claims that it would have been morally right for someone to assassinate Hitler, and though I am uncertain about this, it is easy enough to grant it for the sake of argument. Presumably, if it would have been right to assassinate Hitler, that is because Hitler was an evil man who, if not assassinated, would and did go on to bring about the deaths of millions of innocent people. If, if it would have been all right for someone to assassinate Hitler, it would presumably have been all right for anyone to have done so. The maxim, to prevent genocide, I will assassinate Hitler, meets the standard of universalizability. Does it also meet the standard of universally willed acts, or of Parfit's principle of rational consent? Is it an act that could rationally be willed by everyone? This seems to me less clear. It is doubtful whether Hitler could have rationally willed that anyone assassinate him, or even that Hitler's mother could have rationally willed this. And to be honest, I am not sure that my judgment of whether it would be right to assassinate Hitler really depends on settling the question of whether Hitler could rationally have agreed with me. If it doesn't, that would suggest not only that the formula of universalizability is not equivalent to the formula of universally willed acts, but that the formula of universally willed acts is not an absolutely necessary condition of moral permissibility. For my second example, imagine an elected official who is unusually smart, dedicated, effective, and incorruptible. A number of government contractors have offered her gifts which she would like to be able to accept. Since she is incorruptible, she would not be moved by these gifts to reward these people with more or better contracts, 
And since her constituency, we may suppose, correctly believe that she is incorruptible and want her to stay happy in her job, they have no objection to her accepting these gifts. That is, everyone consents to her accepting gifts from government contractors. So the act of her accepting these gifts passes the test of universally willed acts. Nonetheless, I am not sure that it would be all right for her to accept these gifts. She would rightly not want others in her position to accept such gifts. And so, were she to accept these gifts, she would be making a special exception for herself. Here then, although the maxim, out of self-interest I shall accept gifts from government contractors, appears to satisfy the condition of universally willed acts or of rational consent, it does not satisfy the condition of universal law or of universalizability, and this seems to make it morally questionable. If it would indeed be wrong to accept these gifts, even if everyone consents, that again suggests that the formula of universalizability is not equivalent to the formula of universal, universally willed acts. This time, it would also suggest that the formula of universalizely, universally willed acts may not be a sufficient condition of moral permissibility, and that universalizability may be an independent, morally re relevant consideration. In the end, we may find reason to decide that both formulas yield the same result in these cases. If we supplement the formula of universally willed acts with a substantive theory of rationality, we may conclude that, after all, Hitler could have rationally consented to his own assassination, and that the officials' constituents could not rationally consent to their congresswoman's acceptance of gifts. Alternatively, if we supplement the formula of universal law with a, substance, a substantive theory of morally significant properties, which guide us in finding the correct formulations of our maxims, we may conclude that, after all, we could not will that anyone assassinate Hitler, or that we could will that anyone relevantly similar to our incorruptible official be permitted to accept gifts from government contractors. Kant certainly thought that at bottom these formulas were equivalent, and something like this may be what he had in mind. He also thought, however, that there is a difference in the different formulas, which is subjectively rather than objectively pra practical, I'm quoting him here, namely, each is intended to bring an idea of reason closer to intuition and thereby closer to feeling. These last remarks are offered in the spirit of that second thought and the idea connected with it that there may be more than one kind of impartiality that is morally significant. Susan Wolfe describes and discusses, I think, seven different ways in which some act could be claimed to be wrong because its maxim cannot be universalized. I discussed four other versions of Kant's formula, which I called the stated and actual criterion of strict duty and the moral belief and law of nature versions of the formula of universal law. Wolf doesn't discuss those four principles, though she makes some claims which can be applied to them. So between us, we discuss a total of 11 ways in which some maxim might fail to be universalizable. You'll be relieved to hear that I shan't discuss all of these 11 principles. There are two main differences between the seven principles that Wolf discusses and the four principles that I discussed. First, um, of the principles that, that Wolf discusses when she considers Kant's formula of universal law, none refer to what we could rationally will. Thus she writes, I, if I would not want others to act in a certain way, I ought not to act in that way myself, and one should restrict oneself to doing only what one would be willing to have everyone to do. And I think it's crucial to appeal not to what one would want or will, but what one could rationally want or will. Similarly, when Kant turns to my proposed revision of Kant's formula at the end, she takes one of my suggestions, which she calls the formula of universal consent, to be one should restrict oneself to doing only what everyone would be willing to have you, the agent, do. Now that's what I call the veto principle, which I think is quite unacceptable. <clears throat> 
We, we can't appeal to what everyone would consent to, only to what they could rationally consent to. The other main difference is that Wolf doesn't discuss the moral belief versions of Kant's various principles, and those, I think, are more plausible. We get better results if rather than asking whether we could rationally will that everyone accepts or acts on our maxim, whether we could rationally will that everyone believes such acts to be permissible. Now, this reading, uh, which Scanlon proposed some years ago in unpublished lectures, I think is fully supported by Kant's text. Uh, he at least as often puts forward this as the law of nature than he does the law of nature for me. Well, I turn now to some of Susan's more particular claims. I granted Kant's actual criterion of strict duty one success, the case of trust requiring promises. As I pointed out, Kant's objection to his lying promiser wouldn't condemn most actual lying promises because most lying promises don't have the maxim of making trust requiring promises whenever that would be best for me. They have a maxim like, do whatever's best for me. But as I argued, we must drop Kant's appeal to maxims and should turn to what we intentionally do. And on that revision, Kant's criterion would condemn these promises. Uh, Wolf then claims that Kant's criterion would also condemn other lies. The contradiction and conception test, she says, rules out the abuse of trust requiring communication. That's a fairly significant result. But I think that isn't a result. Wolf says at one point that on Kant's criterion, it's wrong to act on certain maxims if one could not so much as conceive of these maxims being universally adopted. Well, that criterion wouldn't condemn even lying trust requiring promises. Everyone could accept some maxim, even if no one's ever able to act on it. She also says that on Kant's criterion, a maxim isn't universalizable in one sense if we can't conceive a world in which everyone acts on it. Uh, strictly, that doesn't condemn the trust requiring promises, but it certainly doesn't condemn lying. We can conceive a world in which everyone lies when they believe that would be better for themselves. Now, Kant's actual criterion, I suggested, is that if everyone accepted a maxim or believed it was permissible, that would make it impossible for anyone successfully to act on it. And that doesn't condemn lies. We can't claim that if everyone accepted the maxim of a self-interested liar, that would make it impossible for anyone to succeed in deceiving others to their own advantage. However, we don't have a significant disagreement here since Wolf agrees that Kant's criterion of strict duty in any of these versions fails to capture a morally relevant idea. So, Kant's formula of universal law. Wolf says, why should the fact that I would not be willing to have everyone act in some way be a reason to think that it would be wrong for me to act in this way? An answer suggests itself that it's wrong to make special exceptions for ourselves. This thought may be expressed in the idea that if it's all right for me to act in some way, it must be all right for anyone in my circumstances to do the same. Well, that sense of universalizability, though not unimportant, seems to me far from Kant's formula, since it makes no appeal to claims about what we either would or could rationally want or will. It just expresses the truth that an act's rightness supervenes on the properties that make it right, so that any similar act, relevantly similar act, must be right. Wolf then makes claims which could be applied to the law of nature formula. Um, and she discusses the impartiality objection. Uh, she suggests that Kant's formula might avoid this objection if we re-describe the relevant maxims. Perhaps the white racist maxim might be described as refusing to do business with members of a race other than his own. But I think that doesn't help. Um, the question would then be whether he could rill that blacks refuse to do business with him by not trying to use his hotels, and he could certainly accept that. Um, more abstractly still, Will continues, he may be described as wishing to refuse to do business with others on the basis of properties that are morally arbitrary. 
Well, if we're talking about this man's actual maxim, that wouldn't be the right description of it. But I've argued that we ought to revise the formula so that it appeals to what people are intentionally doing. And we might say what he's intentionally doing is refusing to do business with others on the basis of a morally arbitrary distinction. However, I don't think that's the relevant description of what he's intentionally doing. We may decide that in doing what he does, he's giving the wrong weight to an arbitrary distinction. But that's our comment on what he's intentionally doing. And a lot more would have to be said for this objection to work. There are countless morally arbitrary properties which it could be rational to take into account. Turning to the rich, Wood follows Kant suggesting that the rich couldn't rationally will that rich people don't give to the poor since wealth isn't an essential property and they could never be sure that they might not lose all their wealth and become one of the world's poor. Well, I think that's an inadequate reply. First, the rich may know that the likelihood of that happening is extremely small. I mean, they can keep their money in different stocks and shares and so on. Second, Wolf claims that if this unlikely event occurred, this newly poor ex-rich person wouldn't want to have willed a world in which the rich give nothing to the poor. But that version of Kant's formula, as Rawls points out, is much too strong. It assumes we couldn't rationally will something if there's a possibility we might later regret having willed it. Wolf says that this kind of move, redescribing the maxim, can't be made in some of other cases. No, this isn't redescribing the maxim, that's saying be careful. Yeah. Such as those involving differences of race or sex. Well, I think in the case of sex, that isn't clear. It's at least as likely that a man might discover he has transsexual tendencies and turn himself into a woman as that a rich man might become very poor. However, um, she continues, if the core behind the idea of universalizability is that it's wrong to make an exception of oneself, a natural extension of that idea would recognize that it's wrong to make an exception of one's race or gender as well. Well, on Kant's formula, acting on a maxim is wrong if the agent couldn't rationally will that everyone acts in that way. And on Will's suggested extension, an act is wrong if it makes exceptions of one's race or gender. And that, I think, really is far from Kant's formula. Uh, she suggests other ways of rescuing the formula. Um, but there are other simpler revisions. Um, and I think the best, simplest revision is to switch to what everyone could rationally will. That's very Kantian. And it meets the, this objection perfectly. Um, well, finally, she discusses the rational consent principle and the wider formula of universally willed acts. Case of Hitler, um, she says, could Hitler or Hitler's mother rationally willed that he be assassinated? Well, there is a question there, but I think the answer is yes. Um, helps to return to the question whether people could have rationally given in advance unconditional consent to being treated in some way, even if they later don't consent. And Hitler could have rationally willed in advance that if he became a mass murderer inflicting suffering on millions, he be killed before he do more harm. I mean, he probably, unlikely that he would have, but he, he had sufficient reason to will that. Uh, Wolf then continues, some of us might, if we're being honest with ourselves, wonder whether our moral attitude to the prospect of Hitler's assassination really depends on whether it could be rationally willed by Hitler himself. And she, she suggests that if the answer is no, that would show that the formula isn't an absolutely necessary condition of moral rightness. Well, I accept the first suggestion here, but I'm inclined to reject the second. Our attitude to Hitler's assassination would not, I agree, depend on whether it could have been rationally willed by Hitler himself. The rightness of the assassination could be plausibly defended in many other ways or by appeal to many other principles. Our question is only whether the consent principle here gives the wrong answer by condemning Hitler's assassination, and I believe it doesn't. Um, she ends with the incorruptible elected official. And as she rightly says, such cases may suggest that the formula of universal consent may not be a sufficient condition of rightness. Now, I didn't intend it 
claim to be that. That's why it says an act is wrong if people couldn't rationally consent, not if and only if. However, if we're looking for a single principle that appeals to the idea of rational choice or consent, then I think we should turn from the formal of universally willed acts to the principles whose universal acceptance. And that's what I shall discuss tomorrow. Uh, but I just end with one small point. Um, Wolf doesn't discuss my argument for the claim that Kant should give up his appeal to the agent's maxims and appeal to what he intentionally does. And I thought the case of the egoist and Kant himself seems to me to show that. Now, this proposal isn't in, in British parliamentary terms a wrecking amendment. I don't think it weakens Kant's view at all if he drops all references to maxims. Uh, and I wondered if she would think that too. The, the tyrannicide example and the example of telling a lie in order to save the Jews, that sort of thing. And I suppose uh, it, it wasn't clear to me what we were supposed to be imagining in those thought experiments. It seemed at least as plausible that a world in which everyone believed that tyrannicide was permissible uh, would be a world in which the guards also believe this. Uh, and it seems to me at least possible that in some of the closest of those worlds that it is, uh, it is um, for different reasons than it would be in the actual world, but it is possible successfully to act on your tyrannicide, tyrannicidal uh, maxim or policy. It might be the guards would help you in that situation since they believe it's permissible to do that sort of thing. And to make sense of that belief, you've got to assume enough else about the rest of their moral beliefs um, to, to make that a sensible thing for them to hold, you could say. And when you hold all these things fixed, at least some of the closest worlds in which that condition is satisfied might also be worlds, it seems, in which I successfully uh, act on my tyrannicidal policy. And, you know, you might say something similar for the case in which everyone believes it's permissible to tell a lie in order to save the Jews. Um, that's also a case in which, uh, you know, even the, the Nazis believe this. And, well, I don't, you know, it's really hard to get your mind around those kinds of thought experiments, but, uh, but you know, I don't see why it's, we should rule it out so quickly that um, it, some of the worlds in which uh, that is universally belie believed by everyone, including the, the Nazis, are worlds in which it is pos possible for you by lying to, uh, to actually succeed in <coughs> saving some some Jews. It's not necessarily the case. It's not obviously the case anyway that the Nazis, if they believe that that's permissible, are going to be uh, doubly vigilant about uh, protect, uh, prohibiting you from doing what you're doing. Um, anyway, so I wanted to hear a little bit more about why. Uh, well, I think I'd say that um, there are different versions of the case in which the argument wouldn't apply, but I'm supposing that the facts were as I've described. I mean, even if everyone, including the guards, believed that the tyrannicide was not wrong, it's not that difficult to get guards who will nonetheless act as guards, despite having that belief. So, I mean, I think I'll just say, my examples, what I suppose to be true, uh, isn't wildly implausible. Actually, it's fairly plausible. Now, you can describe other possible worlds that aren't very distant, in which it wouldn't be true, but it's enough to describe one world in which it would be, unless it's really fantastic, and I don't think that's so. Um, I mean, I think if you look at the difference in what happened in Germany and what happened in Italy, uh, you get very striking differences of exactly this type um, in the Second World War. Well, but, uh, but the, the test asks you whether the, the universal accept a belief that the acting on the maxim is per permissible would make it impossible for anyone successfully to act, act on that maxim. That seems to me to require that, uh, you know, any of the close possible worlds in, that all of the close possible worlds in which um, the belief that it's uh, permissible to act on this maxim. Well, 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 that might be the case, but I don't see why, because what I'm saying is, look, even if in the world as it actually is, or it actually was, even if, in this kind of case, the formula would be okay. We can easily suppose a world, not very different from the actual world, in which this formula would have given clearly the wrong result. Um, and I think that's enough. I don't have to say, you know, that in every possible world, it would give the wrong result in this kind of case. 
But perhaps that's wrong, but I assumed it was enough to get counterexamples, and this is a counterexample. Well, I just, I guess I'm, I'm still, the, the, the thought experiment we're asking here, when we're, we ask that, we, we ima- try to imagine that the belief in the permissibility of some kind of action is universally accepted, and then ask whether its being universally accepted would make it impossible for us to act uh, um, on the original maxim. It's, it's a very hard thought experiment to get your... No, well, we're asking not whether in the actual world right. something's true, yeah, but asking... whether if the world had been, as I suppose it would be, as long as it's not wildly implausible, what would the criterion then have implied? Um, I mean, to say, oh, but that's an imagined case, it wasn't actually true, doesn't seem to be relevant. No, I, I'm sorry, that was not the, the complaint. I mean, the, the, the criterion is, in, in any case, asking us to imagine uh, what things would be like uh, yeah. if a certain counterfactual condition were satisfied, namely that everyone believed that a certain kind of action is permissible, right? Yeah. And... Okay, and so every every application of this asks us to imagine about uh, imagine what would be the case in a certain counterfactual situation, and uh, in particular to ask whether assuming a certain counterfactual condition to to hold, namely that everyone believes uh, a certain kind of action to be permissible, it would be impossible uh, to successfully act on the original intention. Uh, in, that, that seems necessarily to be a thought experiment. Well, I mean, what I'm, what I'm assuming is that, is that what I'm... Those possible worlds in which this counterfactual well, condition is satisfied. If the head of the Gestapo, yeah. some of the agents said, well, look, there are all these people who, you know, won't tell you the truth about where the Jews are, so you shouldn't just go and ask people, you shouldn't trust what they say. And then the Gestapo said, well, we won't do it that way. We won't, you know, if we ask if you're keeping any Jews and they say no, we won't believe them, we'll go in and search. Now... I mean, why can't I say that might have been what would have happened? And if it had been what would have happened, this criterion would condemn lying to the Gestapo about whether there was a Jew in your attic. Right. Uh, um, well, I guess my worry is that what you su- argued suggests that some of the possible worlds in which everyone believes that acting on the maxim is impermissible are worlds in which you can't successfully I, act well, on the I mean, original maxim. one side complication. Clearly, what I'm doing, I'm saying, in one possible world, yes. then certain truths can hold about what, in another possible world, which is related to that one, would have happened. But then I think I'd say I'm building into my account of the possible world plausible assumptions which would have supported the claim that in the relevant counterfactual, it wouldn't have worked. Do you, do you see what I mean? I mean, I see that that there are right. two possible two worlds, um, but at the moment I. I think it's okay for me to suppose that things might easily be, have been such that a certain counterfactual would have been true. That's all I need. Yeah. Um, well, I don't want to keep going too long about this, which isn't anyway a major point, but it, it's, it's hard for me, for what it's worth, to imagine changes in the actual world such that, assuming those changes, uh, um, you know, the thought experiment uh, fails. Um, but... Perhaps this is a lack of imagination on my part. Robert? Well, but, but, well, I mean, why don't we... Why don't we, why don't we yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, if I could, I'd like to just pursue um, Susan Wolf's question about the description of the maxim. Yeah. Suppose that uh, we the, the maxim of the sexist man is not oppress women, but rather oppress people based on their sex. Or the maxim of the racist is not oppress blacks, but oppress people based on their race. Would that solve the problem? I don't think so. Why? No. Um, because um, it could be true of my actual man that his maxim isn't treat people of the opposite sex in the fear, but it's treat women as in fear. And that could be true because he's in a world in which everyone, including most women, believe that women should be treated as in fear. It's just a misdescription. Now, you could say, and I argue, that you shouldn't appeal to his actual maxim, but to what he's intentionally doing. Um, But I don't think that's going to help enough in those cases. Um, Because 
when it's, you know, the powerful and the weak and the rich and the poor, if the description is um, that the powerful people are accepting the maxim, you know, use your power, to, that doesn't... If the conch, I mean, I don't think you're going to get a redescription that's going to work in those cases. Oh, I guess um, the, the, the question is when you say... You know, don't give action. donations to people whose financial position is very unlike yours. Right. Well, that will imply that the poor shouldn't give anything to the rich. But that's not going to worry the rich. Well, if we take it back to the case of race for a second, yeah. why do you say that it's not the actual maxim? I mean, is that a psychological point? No, that's what that's Kant's own view. He, Kant is appealing to the agent's actual maxim. I think he shouldn't, um, but so long as we're discussing Kant's view, we have to appeal to what the agent's actual maxim is. No, but my question is, what counts as the actual maxim? Oh, well, it depends on uh, a combination of what the agent himself actually decides to do, what the policy is. But it also depends, because often you don't fully formulate it, on how you would have reacted if things had been relevantly different. Um, so that's the way you find out what his policy actually is. So in other words, I would talk to the sexist man and I would say, uh, do you believe that you should oppress women? Yes. Do you, does it follow that you should oppress people based on their sex? And if they say no, then it's not their actual maximum. If they say yes, it is. That's how it works. Not quite as simple as that, because uh, sometimes people will not understand what their policy is. Um, but the prior question, as I say here, is whether I was right in claiming. I mean, I think there's no way of denying that there are many people who have only one maximum do whatever's best for me. That's their only policy. And as far as I can see, that's decisive, because clearly you can't say that when the egoist saves a drowning child, he's acting wrongly. Um, so I think you have to turn to what he's intentionally doing. Um, Alan? I agree with Susan that the way that this part of the groundwork has been read has been determined a lot by what people think is fun and neat. Or maybe we could be a little more dignified and say what is philosophically interesting and productive. And I think there is a lot that's philosophically interesting and productive in the way of reading the, the discussions of the formula of universal law and so forth. But I actually think that um, this is a deeply mistaken reading of the text that, and let me just sketch what, how I think the text ought to be read, not that I can defend it at, because it would take a lot to do, but I think you ought always in reading the second part of the groundwork to keep your eye on the ball, which is that he's trying to derive a system of formulations of the moral law. The formula of universal law and its subsidiary formula of the law of nature are the first, most poorest, most abstract, the earliest in a developing system of formulas of which the last is the most adequate and the most universal. And for that reason, I disagree with one thing that you said that um, the most people say, I mean, you're not inviting me alone, maybe I'm the only one who thinks this, but I think when he talks about the universal formula, he's not talking about the formula of universal law, and I think if you look at what the formula says, you will see that he's talking about the formula of autonomy. When and when he says, sorry, you act on a maxim that can make itself. That can make itself. That's different from I can you indeed. can will to be. How can a maxim make itself a universal law? Because the will, the, 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 the rational will does will it, does legislate it. The will that formulates that maxim does at the same time legislate it. That's the, yeah, that's how I read that. Yeah. And also, if you look where that uh, universal formula appears, uh, it appears in the paragraph devoted to the realm of ends formula, which is the more intuitive version of the 
formula of autonomy. So he's listing that formula in the appropriate paragraph. Moreover, the way I read the phrase universal formula is, what he means is the formula that is universal in the sense that it best sums up all five. And that's the formula of autonomy. Um, so, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the general strategy. And I see the, the four examples listed uh, under the formula of the law of nature as a, an attempt, Kant was notoriously bad at popularizing what he wanted to say, and I regard this as an example of his failed attempt to popularize. He was trying to give, toss a bone to the poor reader who doesn't, you know, doesn't see any relation between what the what his abstract reasoning about the rational will and morality that might have to do with ordinary moral judgments, he's trying to give you some you know, grasp on what's going on. And so he enumerates four duties, and he's assuming, picks maxims that would be typical maxims to viol on which to violate each of those duties. And as he says at the end, these are cases in which we already do will as universal law, that's where the duty comes from, the opposite maxim. And so you, he's picked these maxims to be specific contraries of maxims that he takes to be universally legislated. And the point of the four examples, as I see it, is just that when you have these duties and these laws that you've already got, um, then you can, you can be brought fairly easily to see that making, trying to make uh, an exception of yourself by adopting a maxim that is directly the contrary of these dutiful ones, uh, you, you, can't, you can't consistently will both the law that you do will and the contrary maxim, which I admit sort of seems to, that, may, that takes all the fun out of it to re if that's the only point he's making, but I think that is the only point he's making. Do you want to respond there? Um, well, that sounded like saying that he was only intending to make a small, trivial point. I think he had. Mm. I think the supreme principle of morality was intended to do more than that. Sure. All five formulas. All five. Not, not the first, most abstract, poorest formula. It wasn't intended to do everything. Well, I mean, in, in some ways, my interpretation is quite close to yours, because what I'm calling uh, Kant's contractualist formula, it's wrong to act on maxims or act in ways um, that are disallowed by principles that everyone could rationally will to be universal. And it could take the form not disallowed by principles. That, I think, uh, is what Kant would turn to if he'd realized that that differed from the appeal to the maxims that I could rationally will. If he thought that different people could rationally will conflicting maxims, and he considered my case about the rich and the poor, the weak and the strong, the obvious move to make is the one that Scanlon suggests, switch to what everyone could rationally well. And now our point is this, that's very close to the formula of kingdom men's. He never quite says it, but I think you're staying very close to Kant if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And then the claim to make about the original formula is that, yeah, no, it, it needs to be enriched, and this is the way to enrich it. Right. Yeah. My question is precisely about how sympathetic is your revision to um, the original formulation, if I understand rightly, the, the big move in this chart is from our act is wrong unless we ourselves to yeah. our act is wrong unless everyone. everyone. That's this the is the, the big yeah. move. Yeah. And so, and the reason why I'm wondering about how sympathetic the move is is because I always thought that the the, uh, the fundamental idea be, behind this Kantian formula is to uh, ground moral decisions in what individuals uh, can uh, reason or can, by practical reason, allow themselves to do. Well, it's, and now, I mean, that this is it. the fundamental point behind the, the, uh, the Kantian ideas, then the question of what other people could rationally do is, is a great revision. 
So I'm wondering how, how big of a revision it is, or how sympathetic it is to the, to the continent. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think one way of interpreting it um, is that in several of his formulations, not the second one, but in several of them, and in other contractualist views, you appeal to what people could rationally will or choose or consent to, and you do it in a way which achieves impartiality. And I contrasted three main ways of doing that. Um, you can appeal to what the agent himself could rationally will if he supposed that he was going to be on the receiving end. That's the golden rule. You could appeal to whether the agent could rationally will not only that he acts in this way, but that everyone who's able to acts in this way and that everyone thinks that's permissible. So that gets the impartiality because it says, look, you may be able to rationally will that you do it, but you couldn't rationally will that everyone does it. Now that is a way of trying to get impartiality. And my claim is that it, it fails very seriously in these main kinds of cases. Well, so Nagel then suggests, make it more like the golden rule. Uh, Rawls suggests, pull down a veil of ignorance. The simplest move is just to switch to what everyone would rationally will. Now, if Kant's aim was like the aim of some tough Hobbesian contractualists like Gautier, which is to show that starting from a non-moral, rational, self-interested agent, you can show that he himself couldn't rationally choose that he act in a way that's wrong. That would be more impressive, but it can't be done. Um, so it is. So it is a. You have a to great revision and not <laughs> no, so no, it's not a great. No, that. it's not a great revision of Kant's view because I don't think Kant it's thought like that you could show that it's irrational for someone on non-moral grounds for him to act in a way that's wrong. Now, Kant believed that you couldn't rationally act wrongly, but rightly he didn't say um, when he's blind, could you rationally will it would be universal. He didn't say, oh no, you couldn't because you'd be acting wrongly and you couldn't rationally act wrongly. I mean, that just would have had no interest. Uh, this is an attempt to work out what's wrong by appealing to assumptions about what you could rationally choose or will. So it's not a great revision of Kant to appeal to what everyone could rationally will. Um, he comes terribly close to doing it, and I think he only doesn't do it because he thinks it's not necessary. And I also think my other revision, dropping the appeal to maxims, I don't think that that's a wrecking amendment. Um, Honora O'Neill gives two main reasons why she thinks that the appeal to the agent's maxim is an indispensable part of Kant's moral theory. One is she thinks that it solves the problem of what the morally relevant description of the agent's act is, and the other is that it enables Kant to claim that there's a contradiction in people's will when they act in a way that's wrong. Now, the point about the first is that it's not true. It isn't the morally relevant description of my egoist act that he's doing whatever would be best for himself. That tells you nothing about relevantly what he's doing. Uh, as to the second, I don't think Kant does think that you can show that it's irrational for the agent to be acting wrongly, as it stands, because there's a contradiction in his will. Uh, you have to ask the hypothetical question, what if everyone? So I don't think either of those reasons for appealing to the agent's maxim um, have force, and I don't think that Kant loses anything. Uh, if the criterion of whether the act is wrong or contrary to duty appeal to what the agent intentionally did, the agent's maxim has great bearing on whether his act has moral worth and whether you should think of him as a morally admirable person. But those just need to be treated separately. That's what I think. Uh, Susan? Uh, I just wanted to make a comment in connection with this last question. Um, if, insofar as the question is, um, is this a sympathetic or unsympathetic revision of Kant's view, where Kant's view means Kant's overall moral theory, then um, perhaps it's, it's right to say, no, it's not unsympathetic and it's not even a big revision to Kant's view, um, because in connection with your response to Alan, and I, mean, I would agree with this too, Kant's view as a whole suggests that we look at all the different formulations of the supreme moral law and interpret each one in the light of the other as a unified whole, and then we get a view that brings all of these in. 
insofar as the question is, look, in saying that a revision of the formula of universal law is, now let's switch from what I would will everyone do to what everyone would will I do. That seems to me, as it does to the questioner, that's a huge revision of oh. that particular formula oh, well, because I'm... it basically reverts yeah. to uh, the formula of humanity. It, it changes the attention from what the agent is thinking to what other people yeah, but, can rationalize. But, I mean, what I'm treating as the plausible Kantian revision is not whether everyone could rationally will that I do what I'm doing. I mean, I had that on the list because it naturally comes out of the taxonomy and it's quite an interesting principle. Um, but the natural move from the formula of universal law, particularly in its moral belief version, isn't to that. It's to whether everyone could rationally will that such acts be believed to be permissible. Oh, um, so well, I quite okay. agree. I had, a different, yeah. I, I had a different suggestion, which you may still regard as a yeah. sympathetic one. Um, I left out the morally believed stuff because... Yeah. Having not read Tim's unpublished paper, I have never seen that in Kant's writing at all, and never. So I well, just let never me thought. Get, well, but wait, but wait, wait! Yeah. I just had a different point, which yeah. was something <laughs> you said at the end of your comments to me, which I thought was exactly right in your further move, which is to switch from a principle of universally willed acts that says, "Look at what everyone would will that I do on this occasion." to a principle of what everyone, what principles everyone would accept, yeah. right? Um, by making that move, you're building in both the attention to what others feel and the move that's essential to the first formulation, the universalization formula, which is to look at things at a principles level of what, you know, yeah. what people generally do or as a, and that's, I think, the really important move that sort of brings the universal law formula into the formula that you're eventually going to be... Yes, I agree. And, and the natural way to treat the formula of universal law with acts <laughs> is that that's a broader version of the consent principle. And, I mean, I, I do think that if you ask what can be made of, he cannot possibly agree to my way of treating him. As I said last time, uh, O'Neill and Korsgaard think, well... If he can't possibly agree to it, that's because we haven't given him knowledge and power over the proceedings. And that suggests that we have to give him knowledge and power. We shouldn't treat him in any way that he doesn't choose to be treated in, the veto principle. And that, I think, is just far too strong. Well, if you switch to, no, not have we given him the veto, but if we gave him the choice, could he? Well, the answer is trivial. Yes, of course he could. The question is whether he could rationally present. So I do think that's plausibly there. And now, the formula of universal will act is just the wider version of that. But you're quite right in saying that the natural inheritor of the formula of universal law is uh, the contraction of this formula which appeals to the principles that everyone can rationally um, I'm sure that's right. And, I mean, one way of putting that is that, that you could will to be a universal law. Now, that's very plausibly a matter of the principles. Um, now, in the other version, it's that you could rationally will everyone to do it, but actually that doesn't work as well, as that it's a universal law about what people may do. Uh, whereas the formula of the realm of ends, there's no reference to universal law, and that's why that more naturally leads to consent. Um, that's my way of... Chris? Uh, yeah, I was wondering if, in a different respect, you might be too charitable to Kant. You say that the, um, with the respect to uh, pollution cases, sort of the tragedy of the commons cases, his formula, well, That's actually, you say it only works better, but uh, works better than other formulations. I'm wondering how well it works in those cases at all. In the first place, where it's going to work will depend on, so let's say it I think you assume it works where the costs of everyone polluting outweigh 
whatever gain there is to my own um, yeah. my own you putting it. gain and something that imposes a much greater right. cost on others, but it's so thinly spread that the effect on each other person is trivial or imperceptible. But so even in those cases, uh, it's going to depend upon a very narrow conception of rationality, a narrow conception of cost-benefit rationality. No, I don't, I don't see why that. Well, oh, sorry, hold on sorry, one second. Sorry. But, um, but the main problem is that it won't work in a lot of cases that intuitively still count as sort of morally impermissible free riding, namely all those cases in which it's in my interest to pollute and it's better yet when other people don't pollute, but it's still in my interest when others do pollute or, in, or in, you know, extract some benefit from the commons. And we want a principle that's going to exclude those cases. Well, no, but you're, yeah. this doesn't. Well, I mean, in a fuller statement of it, the point is that the question is, could I rationally will that everyone rather than no one acts in this way? And these are all cases in which if no one did it, that would be better for everyone than if everyone did it. Right. Prisoner's dilemmas. Right. The problem is that... However many other people are doing it, it can be better for me if I do it. Right. Um, now, that applies in ordinary prisoners' dilemmas. Um, the point about the perceptible, imperceptible, and trivial harms cases is that many people think, you know, even if you take into account the effects on others, if it's hardly making a perceptible difference on anyone, people think, I think, well, I can't be wrong. Uh, now, I actually think that on a proper reading of how you should assess the effects of your acts, that's a mistake. But that's reading that most people are not going to find very plausible. And that's the case in which you say, well, what if you had, could choose with everyone rather than no one did it? Then everyone gives the right answer. Because by definition, these are cases in which um, each act benefits the agent but imposes greater costs on others. Um, so it would be better for everyone if no one did it than if everyone did it. Uh, and moreover, I should add, this isn't restricted to cases of self-interest. It'd be better for everyone's children if no one did it rather than everyone did it. Um, parents' dilemmas. Yeah. Um, I mean, as Broad says, it's, it's the moral microscope. It, it, it blows it up in such a way that then people are going to see. Um, and I think that's, what if everyone did that? Kant was, as it were, developing that thought. But it only works in some cases. Uh, final question. Yes. Uh, great. <laughs> um, now, I let's take on Kant's idea that uh, this universal will will be good for everyone. But how does he account for the skill that some have in pursuing rational truths? And uh, while most people will struggle to perceive rational truths, is rationality impaired or aided by nature, um, or is it by training the rational mind in like schools or churches, or is it is it a free choice um, to inquire, which we sometimes don't make because of risking <coughs> discovery that some fears discovery of our inability. We fear that we don't actually have this rational will. Is it one of those, or does he does he answer that at all? Uh, I think Alan would be more able to answer that than me. <laughs> <laughs> you're the one who's on the spot. No, but you're the person, that was a question about Kant's views. Yeah. And you understand those much better than I do. <laughs> well, I don't think I, I don't think I want to try to answer it. So. <laughs> I think the time has come for me to go and vote. Uh, yeah. And um, you're all invited back tomorrow, same time, here again, to hear the third of Derek Harvard's Tanner lectures, which was titled simply Contractualism. Thank you very much. <laughs>